Eero Saarinen was born in Finland in 1910, August. When he was 13, his family moved to the United States, to Michigan, in fact, where his father became an art professor. Between 1929 and 1934, he studied art and architecture in Paris and at Yale University. He joined his father's architecture firm in 1936. After designing some groundbreaking furniture, he submitted the winning design for the St. Louis Gateway Arch in 1948, though that wasn't constructed and completed until more than a decade later. Moving from furniture to buildings, Saarinen designed several remarkable American structures and served on the jury that selected the winning design for the Sydney Opera House in 1957, which is where my family first encountered Saarinen. My great-uncle, Harold Smith, submitted one of the designs that Saarinen would have rejected for the Opera House, although the Sydney Morning Herald obituary for my great-uncle did say his design was, quote, highly commended. The second encounter I have with Saarinen is in 1985, August, almost a quarter century after he died. It was at Saarinen's TWA Flight Center at John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City, though it would have been called Idlewild Airport when Saarinen submitted that particular design. The president of TWA personally selected Saarinen's firm for the task. Saarinen, it's written, wanted the new terminal to have a practical purpose and not only, quote, interpret the sensation of flying, but also to, quote, express the drama and specialness and excitement of travel. In the summer of 85, my mother and her mother and I flew to Spain for a 10-day guided tour operated by TWA. It was my first time away from North America. I had to bring a lot of clothes, so there wasn't much room for books. I brought one and only one book with me on the journey, Doctor Who and the War Games by Malcolm Hulk, the subject of this week's episode. Why that book? I had purchased it just two weeks before at my first Doctor Who convention, and it was a 10-episode story. 10 episodes? For a 10-day trip? I figured I'd read one episode a day, either while flying on TWA airplanes or while wending our way from Costa del Sol to Madrid on our tour bus. I was too young to take in the wow factor of Saarinen's TWA terminal, but it was the only time I ever took a flight out of that building. The war game's plan was a bust. As we had lunch at one of the restaurants in the terminal, my father, who wasn't coming to Spain with us, solemnly advised me to keep a diary of the trip, so I'd remember everything years later. Of course, good luck handwriting a diary at 11 years old on a bumpy bus jostling through the Spanish countryside. The diary notion lasted exactly two days into the 10-day trip, which is a day longer than the War Games book lasted. I think I'd finished Chapter 1, which covers Episode 1, before our plane was even wheels up before we'd even left the Saren and Design Terminal building behind. Probably finished the book before we arrived at our first Spanish hotel. By the time we got to Sevilla, my mother took pity on me and bought me one of the only English-language books we could find in the hotel gift shop, the novelization of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is much longer than War Games and which lasted me most of the rest of the trip. Then I probably read War Games a second or a third time before the trip was over. That was the last time I ever took one, and only one, book with me on a trip. Saarinen's TWA Flight Center still stands, though it no longer houses an airline. It's now the TWA Hotel, on the grounds of JFK Airport, and you can stay there. I've stayed there. Some guests will show up in period costume, as period music, early 60s, plays over the loudspeakers. There's an enormous room, which is devoted to the game Twister, and the weekend that we were there, two medical students got married on the tarmac right behind the Saarinen building. It's, well, it's groovy. My biggest regret is that the weekend we stayed there, I did not bring the War Games book back with me. I want to stay at that hotel again and reread the novelization there. To bring me back full circle to that summer of 1985, my summer of Saarinen and Spain and the security chief and Sevilla and, well... Indiana Jones. Direct shot point! Direct shot point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network. Hello, 
all, it's UK Jason from the Trap One Podcast and the Bearded Geek Toy Reviews channel on YouTube. Congratulations, US Jason, on hitting 50 podcasts for your Target novel review show. Absolutely brilliant. I love the show. Long may it continue. Let's hope you get to do the whole of the Target range. Especially love the uh, recent interviews with Philip Hinchcliffe. And also, I can't wait to uh, one day appear on the show myself. So, once again, congratulations. You deserve it. It's an absolute brilliant podcast, and it's highly recommended. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the Doctor Who novelizations, put out by Target Books from 1973 onward in publication order. We're a member of the Direction Point Doctor Who Podcast Network. My name is Jason, U.S. Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. Also this week over on Trap One, I have released an episode which should be out within a few days of this going up on the novelization of The Stones of Blood, but not the Terran Sticks novelization. That's coming up in a few weeks here on Doctor Who Literature but the newly printed David Fisher novelization, which first came out as an audiobook in 2011. And I am joined by friends of this podcast, Jim Sangster and Fraser Gregory and Keith Say. I will not be able to post a link in the show notes this week because that episode is going to come out in a couple of days, but keep an eye out for it on Trap One, definitely. On Doctor Who Literature, last week's episode put us up at number 32 for science fiction podcasts in Australia, which probably sounds much more impressive in the email from Chartable than it does read out over the air, but it is a good showing for this little podcast that could. Over on Twitter, my Doctor Who pilgrimage has ended as I have now watched every episode Doctor Who put out from 1963 to 2022, and all in just under two years. I have begun my Twilight Zone pilgrimage. That'll be hashtag TZ pilgrimage on Twitter. I am very early on in season one, still in October 1959. This week is the 50th televised Doctor Who serial, The War Games, from the spring of 1969. It's also the 50th novelization put out by Target, starting with their very first releases in 1973 the three reprints of the 1960s Frederick Muller books, and it's also the 50th episode of Doctor Who Literature. And here are some very good friends of the show talking about this podcast, Turning 50, and talking about this week's episode and book, Doctor Who and the War Games. Hi Jason, Conrad here. Um, When I think about the War Games, like a lot of people, I probably think about the ending first of all, um, the second Doctor having his reckoning with the Time Lords and that really, really poignant, beautiful leaving scene with uh, Zoe and Jamie. But as a big fan of monsters in Doctor Who, I also really love the moment where the Doctor requests a thought channel uh, in his defence to the Time Lords to show all the evils he's faced. And you get one of my favourite things in Doctor Who ever, which is a monster montage. Um, So here he shows the Quarks, the Yeti, Ice Warrior, Cybermen and Daleks, in in an order that I think Fraser Gregory would approve of. Um, It's interesting to me that in the novel, Mac Hulk also adds the Crotons in there. So he obviously thinks they're a worthy opponent as well. Um, And these monster montages sort of crop up. I love them. They're in Mind of Evil... Carnival of Monsters, Legopolis, uh, Mordren Undead, and the idea returns as well as uh, you know Terence Dix revisiting the whole idea of giant living games um, in the Five Doctors, where of course you also revisit uh, Zoe and Jamie and that lovely moment where the Doctor recalls this moment in the War Games and how sad it was. Um, but these are this is a happy occasion, uh, so congratulations, Jason, and to everyone who's contributed to Doctor Who literature. It's just lovely to listen to on a Sunday. It's always fascinating. I'm always staggered by how much all your guests know. Um, 
and I really love listening to them. So onwards and upwards, and I look forward to you reaching another Troughton story with a bit of monster action in your 100th uh, review, which will be The Two Doctors. But anyway, congratulations, everybody, and keep turning the pages. Well, the big five zero. Congratulations. You know, if you told me a year ago that when you were setting out on your Dominators themed podcast that you'll be able to get the best and the brightest of fandom um, to contribute to this podcast, everyone from Philip Hinchcliffe to, well, me, would I have believed you? Yes, I would, actually. Who wouldn't want to be on a Dominators themed podcast? I think the real success of your show is that you get the perfect blend of chat with your guest, dissection of the book, it all comes together lovely, but also the quality of the people that you're getting on is amazing and I'm so lucky to count myself as one of those people. But let's move on to the war games then. Um, what else am I going to do for you other than a reading? From the end of the book, we are picking up from the the trial of the warlord who's just gone on trial now but of course for us not just yet i will play fraser's reading at the end of the episode when i reach my script talking about the novelization of the war games then i will drop that clip in at the appropriate time this is shaping up to be my longest episode ever so far, which is fitting because The War Games is the longest serial Doctor Who has done up to that point in its history. So keep an ear out for Fraser a little bit later, and I mean much later, in the program. Here's an email from Kevin in Columbus, who you'll recall was one of my very first emails. Here's Kevin. So, you wanted my War Games memory. Not only was this the first book I bought with my own money, but it was the first book I got without seeing the episode first. With ten episodes, Kevin writes, you would think this would be a slog, but it actually isn't. I knew that the Doctor was a Time Lord, but I thought, at the time, that the Master was the only other Time Lord he met and fought against. I never knew that Time Lords were not named until this story, and Gallifrey was never mentioned. The book follows the televised story very clearly and cleverly, but it does deviate from the story in describing the interior of a Sidrat and the description of the rebels in the farmhouse, along with the firefight between the rebels and the warlord's guards. Kudos to whoever wrote this for giving the war chief a master-like beard. Also, the trial of the doctor is fleshed out, and we even see a little regret from one of the time lords. Cracking good book, as they would say, over the pond. And that's from Kevin and Columbus. Kevin. Thank you so much for being a fan of the show, and thank you for submitting your memory. Before we get to the main body of the show, we have one more audio memory, and this is from my friend Andrew in Maryland, who I have known through Rec Arts Doctor Who and in real life for just about 30 years, and it's a pleasure to finally get him onto the program. Congratulations, congratulations, Jason and the um, Doctor Who Literature Podcast on making it to 50 episodes. Uh, this is a great podcast, very fun, very enjoyable, always enlightening, and it uh, triggers a lot of memories about things I haven't thought about in decades. Uh, you'll be doing a book that I haven't read since I was 12, and um, you or, a, or the guest will quote something from it, and I'll instantly be back at that age thinking, oh, wow, that's where that phrase came from. Uh, oh, and by hitting 50 episodes, given your uh, regular intro and outro, I believe you've referenced Jack Horkheimer at least 100 times, which is 100 times more than any other Doctor Who podcast I've listened to, or uh, pretty much any podcast, for that matter. Um, about the war games, uh, I believe that's a story I would have experienced first through the novelization, although I don't actually remember anything specific about it. Uh, I do remember it was one of the ones that I did enjoy. Um, and I really like the TV version, too. It never feels too long, uh, despite its length. 
Uh, coincidentally, I read earlier this week on Twitter someone saying that only episodes of 9 and 10 of the War Games are any good, and that's what I fear is going to be the kind of nonsense opinion we're going to be getting on Twitter from now on. So anyway, congratulations again on hitting 50 episodes. Um, I'm looking forward to the next 50. And remember, keep looking up. And with that, let's get on to the main body of the show. My interview this week is Ross from the Gallifrey's Most Wanted podcast family. Ross is a frequent guest on the show. We're always very, very happy to have him, as tends to happen when Ross and I get into the same room virtually. The conversation will jump around to lots and lots of the many interests that we have in common. We spent about 15 minutes at the top of the recording talking about the last week's episode, The Power of the Doctor. Uh, What I'm going to do is I'm going to clip that bit, and I'm going to play that at some point in the next couple of weeks, since this episode is running long enough. And with all the uh, volume, I want to keep this as tightly confined to the war games as possible. So you're going to hear most of my interview with Ross, and then as a bonus segment within a week or two, you will hear the rest of that discussion as we talk about the power of the Doctor. But for now, after some messages, my interview with Ross, then my breakdown of the war games, and then a guest reading from Fraser, let's get to it. Hi Jason, Mark here. Just wanted to say congratulations on the 50th episode of your brilliant Doctor Who Literature podcast. It's a great idea for a podcast. I think the target novelizations take a lot of us back to our childhoods and that early excitement about Doctor Who. You've come up with a great format which allows for wide-ranging discussions with a really impressive roster of guests. But most of all, your hosting and incredible hard work at producing an episode every week while also contributing amazing work to the Trap One podcast that makes this a great listen. I'm really looking forward to hearing you and Ross talk about the war games with your usual knowledge, insight, and good humour. Thank you. Do you collect Doctor Who? Do you have Doctor Who items and you don't know that you collect Doctor Who? For all things in the Doctor Who collecting world... Tune in to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, a Direction Point Network podcast. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host, and I have been collecting Doctor Who for 41 years. We have popular features like collection protection and the most outrageous offer. Anywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to Doctor Who Literature, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. So, Ross, the last time that we spoke on this show was six weeks ago discussing the android invasion, which Mm -hmm. we both agreed was not perhaps the best story on TV or the best book. And then we were on Trap One a few weeks ago previewing the BBC centenary special, The Power of the Doctor. And that was the last time that I spoke to you. So before we get to this week's book, which I'm happy to announce is a little better. Yeah, I think it's a lot better, but, you know, the bar, the, the bar is low. <laughs> exactly. I choose my words with precision. So the episode we're talking about today features Patrick Troughton at the top of his game, about as dominant as he's ever been, especially in episodes 9 and 10. So the war games you have, it's episode 50 of the classic series, it is the 50th Target book in publication order. Is that done on purpose? And it's also the 50th episode of Doctor Who Literature, which is done on purpose because I'm going in publication order. I don't know if book 50 and TV, TV serial 50 were lined up on purpose, but it is a nice little coincidence. And it's also the first book, I believe, that came out posthumously because Malcolm Hulk passed away two months before the book hit the streets, July to September 1979. Okay, that's okay. I didn't even look at I didn't even look at the copyright dates on this thing. It's one of the things that I noticed because I knew that Hulk had died in 79 and I knew the book came out in September 79. It's one of the facts that I give in each episode. So I just happened to look for his date of death and there it was, July. So you imagine the book was probably turned into the editor, maybe I'm sure a David J. Howe would know this. Probably turned it in maybe like six or eight weeks before he passed away. Good God. I mean, they were that quick out, you know. 
<laughs> they were churning out pretty much a book a month, so I imagine the turnaround times were pretty tight. Wow, that is tight. A, D- a David Howe or a Paul Simpson is going to have a lot more inside information as, as to the dates that the books came in versus uh, published. But I, I imagine it was a pretty close call. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, how long did they have to write these things? Does anybody know that? I mean... Considering the Terrence Dix model of up to eight books a year, I can't imagine they had more than four or six weeks on the manuscript. And having spoken to uh, Philip Hinchcliffe earlier, he made it seem as if the books also came in on pretty tight turnaround. I think he said about four weeks. Wow. So there wasn't a lot of time to craft a manuscript over a period of years and refine the dialogue and the metaphors. These were pretty much, you know, direct from typewriter to publisher. Wow. Well, that's, uh, but I mean, I'm doing this all from memory because it's been decades since I've read any of these, really, that I know certain writers' ones were always a little bit better. You know, I like the Ian Martyrs. I like David, the two David Whitaker ones that I can remember David Whitaker ones. Um, but, you know, this one I really liked. I mean, I, so I'm trying to think back if there's any others. I'm, I can't place another one of his that I may have read before he passed. How many did he write? Three or four? So this was the seventh and final one from Mount wow. Hulk. So he had done all five of his TV serials from the Pertwee era, except for Ambassadors of Death, where he was the uncredited writer. He didn't get screen credit on that. That book ended up coming out almost a decade after he passed away. And who wrote that one? That ended up being a Terrence Dix, and it's a very good Terrence Dix. We're going to come to that in much later course on this show. But Malcolm Hulk wrote, and this will be for my show, Episode 5, Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters. He wrote that. Episode 9, Doctor Who and the Sea Devils. He had written that on TV. Episode 15, Doctor Who and the Green Death. That was written by Barry Letts and Robert Sloman, but Malcolm Hulk. It's basically a Malcolm Hulk-type story with the environmental and the evil corporation theme. So when Malcolm Hulk writes the book, it's almost as if it's just his own personal story rather than a contract job. And then episode 20, Doctor Who and the Dinosaur Invasion, he had written that for TV. And episode 25, Doctor Who and the Space War, Frontier in Space, he had written that for TV. He was the co-writer on War Games, and he was the co-writer on Faceless Ones, and he was the ghostwriter for Ambassadors of Death. So the only target books that he didn't write of his own TV stories were Ambassadors and Faceless Ones. Everything else was his. This is his seventh and his final book. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize he'd written that many. At the beginning, he and Terrence Dix were basically the kings of the line because they each were doing two or three books a year. And there was a there was a one brief moment where Malcolm actually had more books than Terrence, but that didn't last more than a month. And of course, by now, late 1979, Terrence is the undisputed king of the range, and Malcolm Hulk has already passed away, so he's not going to get any closer. Did Martyr come in after Hulk died? Martyr actually came in a little bit earlier. So Martyr's first book was 1978, The Ark in Space. His second book was early 1979, The Sontaran Experiment. And he is coming in right behind Malcolm Hulk on book number three. So Rebos Operation, which I think is the last 1979 book, was also Ian Martyr. And then after that, Martyr became a regular, basically did one a year until he passed away while writing Doctor Who, uh, The Rescue, which ended up also being published posthumously. Oh, right. I didn't know that. That's cool. I was surprised this, my birthday was last week, and I'd forgotten that I have the same birthday as him. Because I was like, why is there so much Harry Sullivan on my feed? Oh, crap. That's right. Yeah, he was, he was born and died on the same day, October 28th. I think he Did he die on this? Oh, my God. Died on his wow. 42nd birth, 42nd or 43rd. Damn, that's that's messed up. <laughs> it's uh, the fact that, I mean, we are both now well, we both had birthdays this month, or October, I should say. He, he, we made it well past 42. It is just not fair. I'm going to be 60 in two years. 
and I'm almost a, uh, almost a decade behind you. But the fact that he he could have written New Adventures, he could have written Eighth Doctor and Past Doctor Adventures, he could conceivably have pitched for the new series if he had just had you know a more reasonable lifespan than 42 years old. Diabetes is a very cruel disease. I have it, and I can't imagine. But he had it years. I mean, there's you know how many years? There's f- 30 years of advancements and medications and. So, but he also had type 1. I Luckily, I have type 2. So what's a, let's... Uh, I really... Uh, because I'm... But, but man, I cheat a little bit, folks. Is I listen, if I can get the audio book and read it, I try to do both because just time. And I was very lucky it was a David Troughton read one. And I think I went to hunt his other books out. With audible credit, when I have an audible credit, I may go get another one because it it was so good. he was so good at it. I know he also did the Abominable Snowman because I've heard that. I don't know which other ones he's done because I don't have the whole audio collection. The print books, yes, the audios don't have all of them. Yeah, I have a few, um, and I mostly got the you know the audio when BBC did the the soundtracks, the audio sound. You know, I was more interested in those. Than having someone read, you know, because I read all these, you know, and when I got them in '83, because I got most of them in '83. My War Machines is a third printing. I have the four. I have the 1983 printing, the fourth edition, and I bought that yeah. at my first Doctor Who convention, July 27th, 1985. Okay. Does yours have the the painted cover with the TARDIS, the Roman guy, soldier, the generic British officer? Yes, this is the uh, John Geary cover. It was the original 1979 painting. This was John Geary's third Target cover in a row, actually, because immediately before this, he had done the cover for Image of the Fendall, and then he had done the cover for Robots of Death. I like both those covers. I like this cover. I think this is a really... I mean, it doesn't have Trout on it, but it's a really moody cover with a really bright TARDIS and the searchlights in the sky, and as you say, all the different... Soldier. Yeah, I think that's why I like it. Is that it's just the TARDIS and then the different and the and the all the people all the people, you know, dragged into the war games. Let's backtrack a moment and talk about the television. I know that on Gallifrey's Most Wanted, you and Vic are doing the stories in TV order, but you're going each Doctor down the line one through thirteen and then doubling back around. Yeah. So the last Trouton episode of yours that I heard, I think, was Enemy of the World. So you were probably still in the middle of season five. Yeah, we got. Yeah, we'll get. We, we end up. We figured out we do about th- two and a half, three a year. Oh, so you've got. We do two, oh, it's going to be forever. Him and Hartnell will. Him and Hartnell will last the longest because they did so much more. Yeah, they were in production year round, which is ultimately what did Patrick Trouton in because he was doing the episodes in the studio Monday to Friday, and then he was away on location Saturday and Sunday for the next story. So he had no time for either of his families. Yeah, it's it's amazing that you know the amount of work they did. I mean, because you know, and I and I look back to TV shows in the sixties. Like I'm a Star Trek fan. They modern American TV is twenty to twenty five episodes. That's kind of the model. But they did they did like 36 a year the first two seasons. And that's a lot. To me, that's a lot. Because an American TV show takes nine days to film on average. So season five was his only full season because he came in with the second story of production season four. Production season five goes from Abominable Snowmen all the way up through The Mind Robber, which is the end of production season five. So that means he only did five serials proper for production season six, which goes from Invasion to The War Games. However, even though that's only five serials on paper, one of them is an eight-parter. And one's a ten. (laughs) Exactly. So even though it's a shorter season, there wasn't really a whole lot of rest for the wicked. So when did you first see the war games on TV versus when you first read the book? Which came first for you? I may have read the book first because I would have gotten this is two omnibuses because that's how they broadcast it in D.C. 
and I I would I'm I don't know I think I may have read the book first I read a lot of first and second doctor first before I saw it um, and the book is has everything in it but it's told a little more economically very very economically it's yeah. very heavy and I think they get all the points but um, because I, and also the omnibuses were of this story were so badly edited because there was some, you know, scene at the end is shot again, but from a different, you know, differently for the next episode, a little bit, I think had some of that. There was, this is one of those ones where it had a big chunk, like part of one episode was at the tail end of the first part. And at the begin, and it really, it was really badly edited how they divvied it up. And I don't, and I think that was the, the, you know, the syndicating company did it, not the BBC. You know what I mean? It was the same problem with the omnibus for underworld, which kept a bit of Howard De Silva's narration at the episode one cliffhanger. Well, Oh God, I remember that scene. Oh, for some reason that ended up in all the omnibus ones. And that, you know, that was a totally different company. Because that was Time Life, it was Time Life that had Howard Silver, not uh, and Lionheart, and then no, it was Time Life had him, and then Lionheart was the the later person, the later group. Right, Time Life did the nineteen uh, seventy syndication. And yeah, Lionheart had it in the eighties. So when I had it on PBS starting in nineteen eighty four, there was always the distinctive Lionheart fanfare at the very end of the episode. So when I hear that explosion at the end of the Peter Howell theme, which mm -hmm. is the same one that you used to end your comics podcast up until recently. When I think of the theme, I hear the Peter Howell theme explosion, and then I hear the, the uh, Lionheart fanfare. Think of that. It, that's a visual memory, that logo. It's, it's like the Tams logo when we had a lot of uh, Tams TV on PBS in America. But I, I think, you know, I think I, I think I read this book first and I, and I think it's a pretty well written book. I think it's, 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 it's to the point it's, it, it uses the dialogue a lot, you know, and I kind of appreciate that instead of trying to describe a lot of stuff. But I mean, he, it's his script. I could hear, you know, I had to make up Patrick Trotton's voice in some books because I hadn't, I hadn't heard, I mean. No, I'd seen him in the Five Doctors, right? And I probably may have seen him in this in the Two Dot. No, I may, and I may, no, I hadn't seen him in the Two Doctors. And I know you saw Pertwee last, so you probably didn't yeah. see him in the Three Doctors until much, much, much. No, later. that was amazing when I saw it because I, I was very excited because I've, I've always been a little underwhelmed by the Five Doctors. Um, I like it, but there's a little bit of panta. It, it just it's it's. It's fan service, but it didn't. Because maybe, and then, and I watch it every once in a while, and I go, okay, I like this, okay. But it just, it wasn't, it didn't. It was neat to see them, but you know, it wasn't. I, I was so excited to see the three doctors because I'd read good things about it, really good things about it, and I do think it holds up. And it's got the, you know, it's it's a fun story. Wow, because I'm coming at this from almost the exact opposite angle as you. Five Doctors was one of my very first stories full stop. Because remember, I came in basically with season 20. And Five mm -hmm, Doctors okay. in the States was aired as a four-parter, as if it were part of the season 20. Rough. I've never seen that edit. How rough is that? Are there any good cliffhangers? or? Episode one cliffhanger is Sarah Jane slowly rolling down a gentle, sloping, grassy knoll in Wales, which in the novelization, she's about to fall off a bottomless cliff. Oh, yeah. God, it's, you watch it, and it's like, why don't you just stop rolling and stand up and walk up the hill? Episode two, the cliffhanger is Susan and Turlo are the TARDIS, and they hear a thump, and they open the scanner, and Susan goes, or one of them goes, Cyberman. And then there's the, you know, the ending sting, which is not a cliffhanger at all because the Cybermen had been in the previous scene with the Fifth Doctor and the Master. So the fact that they're outside the TARDIS is uh. not a surprise. And then part three, Richard Herndall goes, no, there's nothing here that can harm us. And then he and Tegan exit camera. 
And then Anthony Ainley comes down the stairs and looks right at the camera. And that was the part three cliffhanger. So what that means is that the cliffhanger reprises at the beginnings of two, three, and four are very, very long. So when I was watching the episodic version, which is all that I saw until the DVD came out, I would have to sit through about five minutes of recap before you get to new material. But what I'm coming to the point is that I'm not convinced that Five Doctors is not the greatest classic series story of them all. I love it that much. So when we get to the Five Doctors on this show, and that's, you know, more than half a year from now, I'm thinking of just doing a very long episode and having one guest for each of the Five Doctors just to make it a really bumper episode. Oh, that'd be cool. So I think that's a, that's a, I think that's a good way to do it. I think that's that's a very interesting way to do it because we all have for me that that was when I got my books that was in the stack because I you know they were a gift to me from a comic shop I worked at and that book had come out so when did that come out eighty two the book for five doctors I think. And I'll have to look this up. I think it came out actually before the episode aired. So the episode... Oh, yeah, yeah, it did. I know it did that. Yeah, so they both came out in November of 83. I think I may have gotten it for... My brother may have gotten it for me from Christmas or something then. Because I got these when I graduated high school and went to college, and that was August 83. There it is. So it airs in the U.S. November 23rd in Chicago. The book comes out November 24th, and then it airs in the UK November 25th. So boom, boom, boom. Five Doctors is the only novelization to come out before its parent TV story. Wow. Wow. But that's, that's a good one. I just listened to that on Audible, read by John Coleshaw. Oh, wow. It's freaking amazing. That's a lot of voices to do, I was going to say. Oh, he does them all perfectly. It's really – I got it. I had an Audible credit. And I got it, and it was well worth it. I had heard to I don't think I'd heard Toby Haddock or someone talk about it, and just you know, just gush about it, and it didn't disappoint. I have not heard that audio. I think I may have you on as one of my guests when I get to the Five Doctors. We'll see, because I'm probably going to have, like I said, five guests. But I will have to make a point of listening to the John Colshaw, which means I'll have to purchase that. It's it's well worth it. It's well worth it. He's he's amazing anyway, um, and I'm a big fan of his. Big he's doing a lot more big finish now that they had the right to use the brig. So I really love Five Doctors. Three Doctors I don't love quite as much as Five Doctors. Although funny story, I got the Three Doctors the book the same day that I got War Games the book at the same convention. Then I had also gotten Keys of Marinus and. 10th Planet, and probably a couple of others that day. So Five Doctors for me, I saw first, and Five Doctors for me, I read the book first. So for me, it has a bigger place in my heart than Three Doctors. But War Games, I know for a fact that I would have read the book first, because I bought it in July 85, and the U.S., at least my local PBS stations, did not get the Trout and Package until end of 85, beginning of 86. So I would have seen the omnibus first, and then my PBS station would have gotten the episodic, because my PBS was episodic. So I would have seen parts 1 through 10 in uh, probably 87 or 88. The very first part of War Games that I saw, Channel 21, WLIW, did a one-time special where they did all the regeneration stories in the same night. So it was part ten of the episode ten of the War Games, and ending with part one of the Twin Dilemma, the twenty-five minute part one of Twin Dilemma. So it's seven or eight episodes between the end of two and the beginning of six. So that would have been the first time that I saw War Games, and I put that all on a single VHS tape. And my mom yelled at me for wasting the electricity, but it was totally worth it because I just watched part ten of War Games over and over and over again. It's that good it's that perfect it is it, it it's amazing and i when i when i first saw it you know it was choppy and i i i don't think i really got how good war games was until i got the dvd uh and could watch it in the format it was meant to be viewed in 
um, you know, my brother and me kind of joked that it was so long and, it, you know, it, they kept going from one zone to another. You know, it's, uh, you know, I love Genesis, said Alex, but him and Harry and Sarah and the doctor cross those bat wastelands way too much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's, it's zigzag. But you got to realize that you're, you're watching something in a row when it's not designed to be watched that way. You know, there's supposed to be gaps in your viewing. They didn't have previously on Doctor Who back in those days, so the recap had to be built into the episode. So yeah. any 25-minute serial made in the 1960s, two or three or four minutes are characters talking about what happened the previous week. And when you watch that as an omnibus, it gives rise to this fan theory that X story is, quote-unquote, two episodes too long because it's recap material that wouldn't be there if you were making it as a single-shot movie. But it oh, needs yeah. to be there for the reasons of production in the 1960s. Now, Malcolm Hulk, I've seen this book criticized as being too short compared to the parent TV serial. I'm going to break that down on the second half of this program. I'm writing my script for that. It's the longest script that I've ever written for the show, just talking about War Games, the novelization. But I will say now, because I've already put this on Twitter, even though it's considered a short book because it's based on a 10-episode serial, for its day, this was as long as a Target book got, right? So in 1974, yeah. Hulk and Terrence were doing 160-page books. That ended quickly. So Terrence did books that were 143 pages, did books that were 120 pages, and did books that were 105 pages, like Image of the Fendal. So he did medium-length, short, and shorter. War Games starts on page 7 ends on page 143. That makes it a 137-page book. This is the longest book that Target was putting out in those days, and it's fairly small print. So by manuscript count, this is probably one of the larger Target books of the mid-70s, late-70s, and all of the 1980s. So Malcolm Hulk put a lot of effort into this. It's just that the TV serial is so long that, number one, he has to be very economical, so there are no long character studies, like in Longer books like The Cave Monsters and The Doomsday Weapon, he did long character studies of tertiary characters because he could. In war games, he doesn't get to do that, but I'll make the point later on, and I'll give specific examples. He cuts out a lot of the capture, escape, capture, yeah. lose, padding of the TV story, and he replaces it with really sharp dialogue and really sharp, brief scenes that are nowhere to be seen on television. So for me, the book is not the TV story. They're two different experiences, but they are both titanic, and they are both among the best examples of their kind. The TV serial on the one hand and the book on the other. I agree. I agree. Um, I think this gives you the essence of the story, the jeopardy, the peril, the intrigue. The, um, you you know, it's not Philip Maddock. You know, it's not that because the war chief, the war ma war master, whatever, all the three big baddies are so good in the story. You know what I mean? They're just, I think they're all three, they're all great. The security chief, the war chief, and what the heck is it? We must tell the war lord. The war lord. Um, he, they... They have a personality, that, and I like you said the di they use dialogue and conversation to to. He just uses it so well in this that you take something that is four hours long and put it into a hundred and what is in my book, one hundred and forty some pages, forty four pages. It's amazing. I think it, it really captures the feel of the story, and. It's still a good read and a good listen. I mean, I read most of it and I listened to David Trouton read it. And it's, it's, you know, it's almost like he's writing it to be read aloud. So I have a question then because I have not heard the audio of this. James Bree as the security chief has a very different. Yes, he has that. Re no, it, it's not that he doesn't do this. I kept waiting for that annoying voice of his. <laughs> It's great on camera, you know, it's great on film, but no, he, um, he doesn't really do, he, he does his dad, and he does Fraser really well, and Zoe really well, and everybody else, his Mexican bandit is pretty good, no less maybe racist than the caricature in the show. 
I mean, they're basically doing Alfonso Bedoya from Treasure of the Sierra Madre. That was the model for the character. I'm convinced. I feel I felt more. I you know, it, if it what had been done before, but I'm. It's a little bit um, uh, Eli Wallach uh, oh, in a yeah. spaghetti western. Yeah. <laughs> Because you know the rules of spaghetti westerns, it's a it's a western made by Italians in Spain with Jews playing Mexicans. Now Eli Wallach <laughs> is like me, from Brooklyn. He grew up in Red Hook. He lived, I think, one fifty six Union Street. He puts the address in his autobiography. So he is as Brooklyn as I am. But the fact I... that he was playing so many <laughs> ethnic characters that do not have his native Brooklyn accent is it just a testament to what a titanic actor he was. Oh, no, and he's good in those movies. I mean, my wife was like, what's a spaghetti western? I described it to her, and she goes, you're making that up. I said, no. It's a western made by Italians in Spain with Jewish Mexicans. But, you know. Our wives have the same names. Uh, but when my, when my Leslie and I got married, one of our wedding presents, you know, we got, you know, you get your, you know, your mixers, your blenders, your, your your silverware, your china, typical wedding presents. One of my Doctor Who friends, because I had one table at the wedding reception for my Doctor Who friends, got me, or got us, I should say, Eli Wallach's autobiography as a wedding present. It's okay. Called, it's called The Good, The Bad, and Me, because he was very amused to find out that when they cast him in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, he was playing The Ugly. So in the, in the prologue to his autobiography, he was cast to play some American mafioso who, who was a real person. I think he was playing him for a TV production. So he goes to the film archives and he gets film footage of this gangster testifying. Maybe it was before Congress. And he's sitting there watching the film footage and they swear in the gangster under oath and they ask him his home address and it turns out that it was the building directly across the street on Union Street from the building where Eli Wallach grew up. So he says, okay. stop the tape. I don't need to hear anymore. I grew up on the same block as this guy. I got it. I got this. <laughs> I always hear when he talks a little bit of my dad because my dad's bro- – my, you knew my dad was mad if he sounded – if his Brooklyn accent was back. And your dad grew up in Flatbush, which Flatbush. is much further east because uh, Red Hook – it's now considered Red Hook slash Carroll Gardens. It's, it's right. It's right on the water on the uh, the western edge of Brooklyn. Okay. How different are the accents from that difference? The Brooklyn accent really depends on who on who you're descended from, because the Italian Brooklyn accent and the Jewish Brooklyn accent are a little bit different. My dad lived in it, supposedly in a, in a section of flashbooks that was like right in between an Italian section and a Jewish section. Because he's a Scot. He didn't have, you know, there wasn't a Scottish neighborhood. East of Flatbush, you're getting into Brownsville, which is where one side of my uh, parents grew up. And then east of Brownsville is East New York, which is where the other side of my family grew up. So one of my great uncles was best friends with uh, young David Kaminsky, who became Danny Kay later in life. Oh, that's cool. Everyone in East New York was very close together. Isaac Asimov and my grandmother were practically next-door neighbors for a time in the 1920s, before Isaac Asimov moved to my current neighborhood in Brooklyn. So now I'm neighbors with where Isaac Asimov used to live in the 1940s and 50s. So my family grew up in the very, very Jewish parts of Brooklyn, Brownsville and East New York. And... Carroll Garden slash Reddick was very Italian, so Eli Wallach would have grown up in a very Italian part of Brooklyn. Okay. He did, he was so – I think he was an incredibly um, underrated actor, but, you know, for me, I just – I love his stuff. I'll watch anything he's in. He's one of my favorites. And in Doctor Who terms, James Bree is one of my favorites. This story, uh, you know, I am told – I think I read this on Rec Arts in the 1990s – when you would go to James Bree at a Doctor Who convention for an autograph, he would sign it, no, what a stupid fool you are. That's like his iconic line. But then um, in Full Circle years later, his performance in Full Circle is so naturalistic and so worried. It's a complete 180 from the character he plays in War Games. And he's able to do both ends of the spectrum, and he's totally memorable. Oh, God, yeah. I think uh, there's something uh, – because it took me – 
it took me a few years to kind of really appreciate war games. And then when I got it in the VHS and I sat down and really watched it in episode form, I really started liking it. And every time I watch it, I enjoy it more. It is one of those Doctor Who stories that it is so, I think it's really well made. I think it's, I think it's actually for 10 episodes, it's pretty tight. Because you're, because he's giving you different characters along the way as he builds up the the resistance. You know what I mean? He does it slowly. You've got car stairs, and then you've got the Civil War soldiers, and then you've got the Mexican bandit. You know what I mean? And the boar and the the, the English soldier from the Boer Wars, the sergeant. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later. But the guy who plays the the, the black American Union soldier, uh, the character is called Harper. He's not named in the book. He has been on EastEnders for the past 21, 22 years. That guy has become a fixture of British television. Oh, and this, and Southern, and the, I will say this, I've listened to David Troughton read the book, and when he used the Southern accent in the, in the book reading, it's terrible. But his, his Southern accent in the show is not bad. Maddox in both the Crotons and in this story, but you cannot tell that it's the same guy because he has no. a physical look at the story that he's playing a very restrained, tightly controlled, silkily menacing character. So Philip Maddox in this story, probably his best performance, just a little bit ahead of Brain of Morbius. I, yeah, I went to tough for me. It's one of the two. It, it, he is my favorite Doctor Who guest star of all time. Always. Because he's just, he's that, it's like, okay, you know, it's like that, the, I, you know, it's like, you know, you don't have to, why are you working so hard, dude? This is Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, wow. He wows me. And I think one of the things that makes me like the TV version, and I think it, they, he captures it in the book, Malcolm Holt, is the alienness of these people. You know what I mean? That that voice is, they're all a little odd. You know what I mean? They wear the glasses. You know what I mean? It, there's something that breathes voice and everybody has a very, the three main baddies have very distinct ways of speaking. And it's not normal. You have Edward Brayshaw as the third member of the triumvirate, the war chief. Now, I don't buy into this theory. That he's the master? The, 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 the master, and I just don't buy it because they were both Terrence Dix characters, and Terrence Dix has never, ever linked the two. Not only that, Terrence Dix wrote a sequel to the War Games in 1991 for the New Adventures, and the war chief is back in it, and he is definitively not the master. So that theory I don't buy, but... The reason why I like that theory, even though I don't buy it, is because Edward Brayshaw is that good that he's playing a Roger Delgado master type. So I can totally understand where that's coming from. Yeah, yeah. It's I I don't never bought that one. There was one of the missing adventures where they have the master, the his previous incarnation before he takes the name the master. What is it, Kanchu? Oh, Koshe. Yeah, it's a. Crochet, yeah, my my dark my dark whatever I can't remember which one it is. Dark so. Path by David A. McKinty. Okay, right. I did enjoy that, but I enjoyed it in the fact that going, yeah, okay, that's kind of fan service, and I get why you're doing it because it's kind of cool, but you know, I just I like the mystery of the master. I don't want. I didn't ever want. You didn't need to explain it to me. Like, and all the big finishes created their own, and it doesn't tell you where they come. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, we're not telling you what it was in. You know, I kind of was hoping Moffat would have, with uh, with uh, Missy, it was like, just, you don't know where she's from, what order she's in. You know, I kind of right. wish he had kept that a mystery. All we know is that she's after John Sim. Well, yeah, but they make, I think the point of that is that she's murdered by her previous regeneration and she does enough damage to him to force you to make the regenerate. She knows that he's about to regenerate into her. Right. You know, that, oh, you killed me. Isn't that funny? Because in about 20 minutes, you're going to be me. 
<laughs> you know, and it's a very master thing. I don't know. Uh, uh, they did this the master box set, and uh, there was part of it as I love is that um, Eric Roberts, who's actually very good in that. Oh, wow. <laughs> he's really because it's he he he's older, he's subtler, and he's not you know he's got better scripts. Uh, but he is a, a re, uh, the Jeffrey Beaver's rotting master is fallen in love. But he's having, you know, the woman can't see his scarred flesh. He's got a, you know, he's got a, one of those perception filters on. Right. And the Eric Roberts one is a later incarnation. And he turns something horrible goes, if she loves you, just turn off your filter. She'll still love you. And then you hear him go in the room and then you hear a blood curdling scream come from the woman. Oh, that is wicked. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like he knows He's doing it to himself. He remembers it happening, and he still does it. It's really it's a, that was remember that masterful box set was so much fun. It was really so much fun. And I actually the the first Eric Roberts set the first story was a little rough, but the second two are really good. He is evil. He just it's not as over the top as his character in the movie. But the malevolence of it is there is nothing redeemable about me. Don't go where, the, where there's no subsex that I'm in pain or whatever. I am the master. And I am evil. And there was a very nice callback to the Eric Roberts master in Power of the Doctor, where Sacha Devon talks about dressing for the occasion. Oh, yeah. And then him going, I don't wear. And seeing. seeing Paul McGann in that costume in a real episode of Doctor Who. Yes. You know, not just, the, I mean, I like the little mini one to give us his regeneration. I thank you, Moffat, for doing that. You know, it was that was a great little teaser. To, you know what I mean? Yes. It's a great little teaser. Um, and it was a surprise. Remember, because it came out two days, what, it's a day early because it was going to leak. And they dropped it. Um. But it was to see him in that, and just that's a great costume. He, I, I'm, I'm a huge. I love Big Finish. I listen to a lot of it, maybe too much, but his and Sixty stuff, I, I can't get enough of it. Just thank you for you know thanks Big Finish for giving us more Six Doctor, and giving us actually seasons of the Eighth Doctor. Yep, and all of his are pretty good. I mean, there's a dog here and there, but for the most part, I really love. Every, I've loved all of it. The the, the original series, you know, the, the Charlie era, um, the Lucy, the you know, the radio era, and then the box set era. They're all worthwhile, and they're all very different. And he can. Uh, they're now asking him to kind of jump in and out of different eras, and you can tell the difference. It's like Sixty, Colin Baker when he's doing. You can. When he's with Perry, and when he's with Mel, and when he was with Evelyn, or different do the Doctor at different times in his life, and all, the performances are subtly different. And um, so, in the bit, the, I think the scenes with all the past Doctors in Power of the Daleks is where I—that's where I got a little misty and was like, "Oh my goodness!" Yeah, and then they gave Peter Davison a scene opposite Janet Fielding. And oh gave, God. Lester was seen op opposite Sophie. That was really nice to have back. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was so good. It was so good. <laughs> um, but uh, back to this one. I think that I like the triumvirate of villains in this, and I think they come, out, they come out well in the book. You know, I think the main characters, I think if I have a complaint, there's not enough Zoe in the book. I think she, the edits hit her the hardest. I'll be pointing this out in my script in the second half of the program. The best Zoe scene on television is not of the book at all. It's one of the few moments where there's a really good meaty segment on TV that is dropped for the most of what's dropped is Patty, but there's a really good confrontation between Zoe and Arturo VR in episode eight that is dropped from the book. And that's a big loss. Yeah, that's what it I was. I, I couldn't put my finger on it. It's like, there's a great scene with her. Where is it? Is it in the Time Lord section? Is it this? But I just think she is She is cut very much out of the book. 
You know? Whereas Jamie gets a hero arc in the book because Carstairs puts him in charge of the chateau and he, you know, boy becoming a man, getting getting put in charge. So Malcolm Hulk is leading into that, whereas you're right, with Zoe, he doesn't give her a whole lot to do. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the thing. Because I think Zoe's a very good companion. I think, uh, as much as I like the Deborah Watling, J- Fraser Hines, Patrick Chowton trio, I think this is their... The, you know, I think Zoe, Jamie, and the Doctor are really one of the... It's a really good tar, It's a really good TARDIS team. And for younger fans, you have Jamie and Zoe getting a scene together in The Five Doctors. So a lot of us watch them in The Five Doctors before we ever had the chance to see the two of them in the surviving season six serials. Yeah. I, I feel sorry for them, that they, them and Franklin a little bit. That they're just images, they're not the real character. Does that make sense? But it was neat to see him. I, you know, I had not seen Liz Shaw or Captain, you know, I knew who they were because I'd read books. I mean, that's the first time I see them. Right. And it's definitely the first time I saw Fraser Hines. So, um, and... I have not watched a, a lot of first or second. Well, I've watched a lot of first Doctor in the last couple of years, but I haven't watched a lot of second Doctors in a long time, other than all the animation that came out in the last three years. Yeah, there's been an embarrassment of riches on the Patrick Trout and animations. Uh, talking about David Maloney again for a moment, some of the other David Maloney repertory actors who appear in this, you've got David Garfield, who later played the religious zealot in Face of Evil. He plays first a German officer who becomes a Southern officer, Von Weich. So I think David Garfield is very nicely sinister in that role. As, as he a does a very good Donald Pleasant. It's a yeah. that's there. That's, 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 <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I love. I like him. I think. The, I think the, the the who's the actor that plays the first ger, uh, German, um, not German, British general. So that's General Smythe. Yeah. And he is the primary bad guy in the first three episodes before we meet the war chief. And then he comes back as a surprise returning villain in his own story because he wasn't in episodes four, five, and six. So when he comes back in episode seven, it's a big surprise. Because yeah, does he come back as the, the Confederate general? No, he comes back as himself. They, 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 go, they go back to the show. Oh, oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. And that is, uh, that's Noel Coleman playing General Smythe. So, I mean, I think this one is, there's not a bad actor in the cast. I mean, I think David Troughton's really good in it. He's got a nice little couple scenes in, what, two episodes? He's in episode six. He has three or four scenes opposite David Garfield, and all that is cut out of the book, because that's the sort of material that you don't need in the book. Oh, no, you don't. Um... I want to say something in the book, too, is when these were written, and as Americans, that they kept using the Negro. I, I, is that, I, it bothers me a little bit. With the preface that I can't really speak to this, being a white guy who grew up in a red line subdivision, I can't really speak to whether or not the word that Malcolm Hulk uses in the novelization is acceptable. It wouldn't have been in my. It wouldn't have been in my household in the seventies. For a fifty-four-year-old man writing this book in nineteen seventy-eight or nineteen seventy-nine, I don't think he had negative intent. In- oh, I don't think he did either. I just was like going, "Is it? What is it? A part of the time? Is that the right? You know, it just it because I'm reading this in twenty twenty-two. It would probably didn't tweak me in nineteen eighty-two. You know what I mean? When I was in law school. I was invited to be a student member of an organization called the American Inns of Court. And that is an organization that matches up experienced members of the bar and law professors and law students. And they all get together once a month to have a catered dinner and a presentation on an area of the law. I don't know why I was invited to join because I was not the most distinguished law student in the world, but I was in law school in the Midwest and I won't say exactly where, but I got to you know hobnob once a month with members of the bar who had their own law firms or were senior partners or had very distinguished solo practices. So it was a who's who of who were attorneys in that city who belonged to this organization. 
And I got into a conversation about Homicide Life on the Streets, which was at the time one of my favorite TV series. That was right towards the end of its run. As a side note, a woman named Lloyd Rose wrote one of the last episodes in the final season of Homicide and then wrote two Eighth Doctor adventures. She wrote, um, I think, City of the Dead and Camera Obscura. I love those, both of those. Tiny little crossover between Homicide Life on the Streets and Doctor Who. Very interesting connection. I'm a huge fan of that. I love Camus Obscura. But the 75 or so year old lawyer that I'm talking to when I'm a young underweight law student is trying to talk about Andre Brower and refers to him using the exact same word that Malcolm Hulk uses in this novelization. And I knew, and of course, you're sitting there in 1998 or whenever it was. There was no way that a grown man should be using that word in 1998. So by that, it was completely unacceptable. Yeah. And I mean, that's what it is. is and I'm reading it because in this country, I think the change happened earlier. You know what I mean? Um, that that word dropped out of favor earlier than it did maybe over there. Yeah, so I don't think that Malcolm Hulk was using the word in a bad sense. I think he thought he was being progressive and enlightened. And Terrence Dix would use the word Red Indian a few times in his novel. Oh, yeah. Oof. Ouch. <laughs> it's, it's cringy now, but we have to understand that these were older men who were using words that they thought were acceptable at the time. And you have to just sort of, you know, swallow it and move on. I think I was more shocked because I heard David Troughton say it out loud. Yeah. You know what I mean? I would have been going, just say black man or black American. You know. Again, the actor who played that role on TV has been a regular on EastEnders for more than 20 years. So it was, you know, one of England's foremost actors. And it's only oh, a yeah. that he couldn't come back for the new series, the way they were able to get Lewis Mahoney back for the new series. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, I wanted to say, I think this is a really good book. I really enjoyed it. I think it tells the story in a very economical way without losing the, the important parts of it that make it a good story. Because I think The War Games is a very good Doctor Who story. I think the TV serial, even though it's literally four episodes longer than Pitch, it was supposed to be six and it became ten parts. If you, if you think about how the concepts are introduced, in part one you see a video screen... Then you see a dematerializing TARDIS. Then you meet the war chief. Then you meet the security chief. You have the scientist. The Vernon Dobchev character is the first person to say Time Lord uh, on television in Doctor Who. And then the warlord shows up last. And then you find out who the Doctor is. Even though it's padded out of necessity, each episode adds some new wrinkle to the ongoing storyline from episode 1 through episode 10. So the progression of tension and the progression of jeopardy in the story is expertly done even though there are a lot of self-consciously padded bits that have to be there because otherwise you're running a test pattern card for four weeks yeah the way they structure the story in light of all that is remarkable now you lose that structure in the book but the padding that is cut out of the book and the new book only material that malcolm hulk puts in again they're two separate animals but i think the book is equally worthy to the TV serial, even though it is not a hundred percent the same story. Yeah. I, you know, I just, you know, sometimes adaptions are better, you know, and sometimes they're, I don't know. Cause I, I mean, I also was like when I was in high school, like the, the movies, the movie adaptation paperbacks were big, like the Star Trek ones, and you know what I mean? The sci-fi books. They'd have one that went with every movie. Right. And, they, and sometimes there'd be great stuff in them. I think one of the Star Treks was good. Nicholas Meyer did some tweaking. Not tweaking, but he just polished something. And it was that was neat. And there was more backstory. Or uh, Alan Dean Foster was the king of those damn things. Yeah, Alan Dean uh, Foster wrote the novelization of the original Star Wars movie, which came out about six months before the film. And he has a lot of material in there that eventually falls out of the canon, but it's a very good book. And then when I was reading the novelization of Empire Strikes back in the early 80s, it actually gives Julian Glover's death scene, which was not shown in the movie. General Veers disappears and is implied to have survived. 
but he has a death scene in the book. And in fact, speaking of novelizations of 80s movies, Ian Martyr, I think, did the novelization of Splash from the Ron Howard movie. Did he? Oh, that's cool. I like that. That's neat. Oh, well, that's cool. But I think uh, this is a very good adaptation of, of uh, and it's very different, but I think it really, it hits all the right spots. It just, it's a good, it, I'm glad he wrote the adaptation. You know what I mean? Yes. I think it, because I think he turned it, he turned a very long story into a very short book with that. And they're both equally as entertaining and they both get hit the right notes. And it's not a short book per se, because it is the upper end of the target page count of the era. It's just short in comparison to the TV series that spawned it. But I don't think the book is bad. I think the book is excellent. And if it's not Malcolm Hulk's best book, that's because when he was doing 160 pagers earlier in the 70s, he was able to do Cave Monster and Doomsday Weapon, which... And I get both. Those are both really good books. Those are really good books. So. Yeah, they both use their extra material really, really, really well. So this is an excellent book. It's not Malcolm Hulk's best, but the material that's added in for the book is wonderful. And in a few minutes after the jump, I will be walking slowly through all 137 pages of the novelization and talking about what I love about it and why. But I want to also give credit to the TV serial. Love the TV serial. I think it's expertly done, even though it's long. And again, you can't watch it all in one sitting. But when you string it out over five nights, like I did for my pilgrimage on Twitter a couple of years ago, it is one of the greatest Doctor Whos of all time. Episode 9 and Episode 10 are two of the finest individual half hours of the 1960s. Episode 1 as well, which starts off with the characters laughing in the mud and then facing a firing squad at the end. So Episodes 1, 9, and 10 are individual standalone gems. Yeah, I just it's, – it's such, it's such an epic – um, and I really like, I mean, I'm not a fan of the big part, you know, the six parters and stuff like that, but two of my favorite stories are, you know, in the Trout era, Invasion and this one, and they're about an eight and a ten. And I think Invasion's a great story. I love Invasion as well. That was an Ian Martyr novelization. And how I first read that book, also therein hangs a tale that I will get to that is probably a year away because this is book 50 and that's book 98 or 99. It'll be about wow. a year before we talk about the invasion. Yeah, I'm going to have to put my old books in order because every time you call and tell me, you let me know which one my next one is. I'm like, oh, crap. Now i got to dig through that stack. They're not in order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the invasion as well, is a it, it's a wonderful book and it adds a lot that could not be realized on television in the studio in 1968. So again – Almost a different animal from the TV serial, but just terrific book. So, Ross, what else are you up to on Gallifrey's Most Wanted and Stop, Let's Team Up and any other show that you happen to be working on? Um, well, uh, on Gallifrey's Most Wanted, uh, me and Vic will record Sunday. We will record our take on Neverland, the eighth Dr. Big Finish. Yes. Uh, and then we're going to go our next um, – Christopher Eccleston one is his first Audi his his first big finish the first one of his first big finish set which is I have feelings about that set <laughs> they're, not, they're not my normal gushing a big finish it may be the first time I really beat a big finish that's gonna be worth uh, listening to though oh yeah 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 because I've enjoyed the second set and the third set a great deal but I have I have feelings about the first set um, and then for uh, stop, let's team up. I, you know, I'm trudging along and changing some formats with uh, kind of speed up my Legion and Defenders because there's a lot of uh, Silver Age Legion I'm doing, and it, I need to speed up because it's the same plot a lot <laughs> in '60s comics. So, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. I've um, I've got a big, I've got a plan. I've got some guests coming up. Uh, 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 some of my regular guests are going to come on together, and we're going to review a cartoon. And um, there's a, a famous comic writer named Tom King who writes out of continuity DC stuff. And um, in the 70s, there was a comics book called DC's First Issue Specials, and it was a tryout book, and there were 13 issues of it. So his next out of continuity project is some of the heroes it, that appeared in those individual issues of that series in the 1970s 
try to join the Justice League, and it goes south quickly and horribly. Wow. And it's a wide revenge, range of characters. Jack Kirby created two new sets of team. He was known for his team groups. Some Jack Kirby's in there. Uh, some uh, new gods, which are big in more modern DC continuity, and something, a really bad spy comic called Codename Assassin, and a co- I, comic, I swear to God, written, uh, it's written by Jerry Conway, who is the head writer, is the script editor for Law and Order, yeah. called Lady Cop. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I'm going to, as that comes out, I'm going to also, I'm going to review the issues of that. It's called Danger Street, and I will also review an issue of in order the first the DC first issue special because there's some really weird comics in there. You know, just some that just some weird it's a weird little series and I I bought I found it on hardback very cheap and I just want and I've fallen in love with Tom King's uh, out of continuity series. There he tries a lot of stuff. He's not afraid to do interesting things. And he's a former CIA agent. Oh wow. And he lives in D.C. And he wrote a lot of Batman. He's known for that. And he wrote a sh- uh, story called Vision for Marvel, which was the Vision creates, a, an art, creates his own family. Huh. And it's about suburban life and how, to, how when you're different, trying to fit in. So I just read his... Um, um, it's not a sequel to Watchmen, but it's a story set in the Watchmen universe... 10 years later or 20 years later called Roshar and it's someone else is wearing the mask and it's it's a good it's a murder mystery because it starts with the dead people and then you have to figure out how they got dead so I'm, de- I'm really looking to lean into some of his work for a while because I find it very interesting and it's funny that you mentioned Jack Kirby because that ties into our conversation about Eli Wallach. Yes, he's from. I think he's from. Is he from Flatbush? I can't remember. My brother would know. He's from the Lower East Side, so he was not a Brooklyn, but he was. Oh, like, that's right. That's right. My brother's a huge Kirby uh, devotee. He was as Jewish as Eli Wallach. His real name is Jacob Kurtzberg. Yeah, it's Sarah Bear. Yeah, he was a street uh, tough guy. Uh, there's some really great stories of someone was downstairs making anti-Semitic comments, and he was fine, and he went downstairs and whooped the ass. <laughs> Not to mention the famous cover to Captain America number one, where uh, Captain America is punching Hitler in the face. Yes, yes, he was. Um, my brother is a huge. That's his guy. My guy's some. My guy's a, another Brooklyn guy. I think he's no. He's from the Bronx. George Perez. So, yes. but but you can tell we, I'm much younger than my brother. All right. So, but those are my things. A lot of stuff going on. And I will give a shout out to two particular pieces of Jack Kirby art. It's a hardcover volume. It's a hardcover compilation on Jack Kirby that came out about 10, 15 years ago. I want to say it was Mark Evanier who put it together. Yeah, they were friends, and he wrote they he wrote a lot of comics and edited a lot of Jack. Mark Evanier was also a script editor on Welcome Back, Cotter, the very British show made oh, in Los Angeles. Well, I think, well, DC did a Welcome Back, Cotter comic book. Right, but there's a two-page spread in the hardcover Mark Evanier Kirby book. It's a Jack Kirby, as a young man, sketch of a street scene on the Lower East Side. The, the, the density of the people and the food carts and the buildings and the horses and the street all put together – it must have taken years to draw that illustration. He probably did it in four, it probably did in four days. Exactly. I mean, no, no, no. You know, he was he, – this is a guy who drew a lot. He did a lot of groups like uh, – uh, uh, God, uh, the Easy Street Gang. A lot of groups of kids, um, and one is Boys Ranch. If you ever see any of his art from Boys Ranch, it's it's stunning. It is – it is um, – Newspaper adventure strip 40s quality, which is that's a lot. That's how Foster, Alex Raymond, Milton Kniff kind of guys. Just it's stunning. It's you know I love a little Jack Kirby. Um, he's he's no longer with us. He was a Richmond comic writer, uh, Mark Ringo. Um, when he was finishing his F- Fantastic Four run, they meet God, and he's Jack Kirby. Oh wow! Yeah, well, so the FF is it. Other than Cap, I think FF is his. My brother would say it's Thor, but FF is his, you know, that's the feather in his cap. 
And the other Jack Kirby illustration that I'll shout out is he and his wife were sending out Hanukkah cards in the 1970s, and he drew the thing inside the card, you know, wearing a, a yarmulke and a talus and holding a prayer book with Hebrew with Hebrew writing on it. So, and it's I I. I I don't put that on my Hanukkah cards, obviously, because I'm not Jack Kirby, but I put that on Facebook every year. One of my favorite Jack Kirby illustrations. I've, I've always loved the fact that the that Ben was Jewish. From the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah. And Ben Ben's my favorite. He's my FF guy. I, he's my favorite in that group. So. All right, well, Ross, it was great having you on again. Thanks for talking about the war games. And as we always do, we drift on to many, many other topics. Yes. I already have you booked for a return engagement. You'll be back on the show in about three months talking about a different book from a different doctor, from a different author, and we'll talk to you real soon. Doctor Who and the War Games, written by Malcolm Hulk, televised as the War Games, teleplay by Terence Dix and Malcolm Hulk, televised in April 1969 through June 1969, published in September 1979. Mud, barbed wire, the smell of death. The year was 1917, and the TARDIS had materialized on the Western Front during the First World War. Or had it? For very soon, the doctor found himself pursued by the soldiers of ancient Rome, and then he and his companions were reliving the American Civil War of 1863. And was this really Earth, or just a mock-up, created by the warlords? As Doctor Who solves the mystery, he has to admit he is faced with an evil of such magnitude that he cannot combat it on his own. He has to call for the help of his own people, the Time Lords. So, for the first time, it is revealed who is Doctor Who, a maverick Time Lord who borrowed the TARDIS without permission. By appealing to the Time Lords, he gives away his position in time and space. Thus comes about the trial of Doctor Who. Here's a quote from the Doctor Who Ratings Guide on its page for reviews of the War Games novelization. Quote, This book represents a brilliant final effort by Malcolm Hulk, that has been spectacularly let down by the enforced abridgment. What is left is the mere skeleton of something great, a book that has tried to be as grand as a novelization of such a significant story should be, but which is instead left feeling incredibly empty, for this target's lack of imagination and unwillingness to really push the boat out has much to answer for. I have not been curating reviews on this story, but I've seen several comments on the Doctor Who Target Books Facebook group And it's not unfair to say that the above quote stands for a pretty broad proposition in fandom. The notion that the 137-page long novelization of The War Games, a 10-episode serial on TV, is too short, too cursory, missing too much of the scene-by-scene action from the TV series. I put the question out on Twitter this past week to my followers, and there was a lot of interesting debate and discussion With this episode running as long as it is, I am not going to quote everybody, but the thread is there. Uh, A lot of other podcasters weighed in, and most of them generally tend to the side of this book is not long enough, either by page count or by interior content. I look at the book the other way. Yes, it's short compared to the War Games, but it is at the longest end of what the target novelizations were putting out in the middle late 1970s. The material that it omits from television is the kind of padding that doesn't read super well on the printed page. The material it adds, on the other hand, in many instances, is better than the material it replaces on TV. Now, the book is annoyingly 11 chapters for a 10-episode serial, but it would have been hard to make the book exactly one chapter per episode, as Hulk for the novelization omits entirely the cliffhangers for episodes 4 and 6. 
I'm going to go through the book episode by episode and point out what's changed, what material is missing, what scenes in the book are better than what's on TV, what lines of dialogue have been burned into my head since I first read this in the summer of 1985, in which I was surprised to find are not present in the TV adaptation. I'm not going to go into Hulk's prose style so much. We have broken down several Hulk novelizations on this show, episodes 5, 6, 9, 15, 20, and 25. This is not Hulk's best book, but it's very, very, very good. And of course, sadly, his last one, as the author had passed away two months before the book's release date. Episode 1. Actually, the book begins before chapter 1, with an ultra-rare, for the target book's epigraph, a long quote attributed to the Warlord, or, as he's called here, the Chief Warlord. When I first got to see this on TV, I was hoping that the televised episodes would begin with this rant, like with the cold open. Alas, they didn't. What a sad, terrible place. Jamie gets the first lines. The book establishes that the Doctor was trying to return Jamie home, Scotland, in 1745, the time of the first Jacobite Rebellion. Zoe is said to be from the far future. The doctor describes barbed wire as filthy stuff, invented by an American to pen in cattle on the range, then used against human beings. The doctor also describes World War I by listing the combatant countries and adding, they all believed they were right and that they were heroes. Subtitles are provided for the German dialogue, and the first German soldier we meet looks, quote, tired, hungry, and unwashed. The TARDIS crew has served tea in mugs that, quote, looked as though they hadn't been washed since they were new. The Doctor describes the mechanics of trench warfare, that awful period in between the invention of the machine gun and the tank. That's a daft way to run a war, says Jamie. It's more than daft, the Doctor retorted. It was terrible. Some more lines. Then Jamie said, I asked you what that awful smell is, Doctor. You never answered. That smell, said the doctor, is death. Hulk has a Terence Dixian-like way with brief character sketches. General Smythe is, quote, a huge man with a square jaw and cheeks like cliffs. He has a way of pretending not to hear the first time to put subordinates ill at ease. Captain Ransom has an inevitable worried frown and file of papers and is appalled that men's lives are reduced to notes on backs of envelopes. Carstairs tries to flirt with Lady Jennifer, but, quote, in those days you did not admit to a lady that your father was in commerce. Right before the first cliffhanger, on page 19, you can't do this, Zoe screamed from where she was held by a sentry. This is murder. Captain Ransom turned to her. War is murder. Hulk, an anti-war book, but firmly on the side of the soldier, the common man. The episode 1 material only takes up 14 pages of text. Now, we know from past experience with Brother Malcolm that he usually saves his shortest page counts for action-heavy or padding-heavy later episodes, like Sea Devils Episode 5, or especially Dinosaur Invasion Episode 5. Typically, his Part 1s run on for pages and pages. This Part 1 is heavily truncated from TV. It's missing several scenes in which the regulars don't appear, such as, for example, every single word that Major Barrington says. It's missing the revelation that General Smythe has a TV screen in its headquarters in 1917. It's missing Zoe's discovery of those screens and her thwarted effort to break the Doctor out of his prison cell. But Hulk's work in Chapter 1 doesn't require those extra scenes. Sure, the scenes are well-directed and well-acted, then add flavor and context to the TV story. But all the dialogue quotes I gave you above aren't on TV. They were all added in by Hulk, who otherwise stays faithful to the TV dialogue in the scenes he did choose to adapt. He's stressing the horrors of war, how bad it was for the common German soldier, as well as for the common English privates, sergeants, and lower-level officers. His second doctor is remarkable. Patrick Troughton on TV was an accomplished clown, and there's plenty of that in the televised episode one, laughing in the mud puddle in the opening image, having Jamie stamp on the doctor's foot by accident. But in the book, the doctor is world-weary, a walking encyclopedia of knowledge on the horrors of war 
and indignant to injustice. But you never doubt that this is the second doctor. Hulk conveys all the wisdom and outrage of Troughton at his best, while toning down the clowning and funny business. In short, these pages are short, but stripped down, spare, every sentence freighted with meaning and weight. This is one of the best chapters in the target line to date, and that's some stiff competition. Episode 2. Hulk writes pretty powerfully for Jamie, giving him sharp dialogue on pages 20 and 21 as he's locked in a cell and forced to confront a British redcoat from his own time, 1745, the first time in the book we meet a character not from the World War I zone. I wasn't to be put in a place like this, he called. I was told to go and die for my country. Masquerading as a British army officer on page 22, hoping to infiltrate the prison where Jamie's being held, the doctor berates, the lower orders have no idea of punctuality. We have to do all the thinking for them. Ransom played on TV to befuddled perfection by Hubert Rees, who did the same years later in The Seeds of Doom, was, quote, always forgetting things these days. That's foreshadowing. This material is a lot longer than episode one, which took up just chapter one on the first page of chapter two. It goes through the long remainder of chapter two and all of chapter three. Hulk condenses scenes. Jamie and the Redcoat from 1745 have four scenes together on TV, but just one in the book. Hulk decides to spend two full pages from the POV of Colonel Gorton, the commandant of Jamie's military prison. Here's an excerpt, a short excerpt, from page 24. Colonel Gorton stood at his office window while an orderly poured his afternoon tea. His view was pleasant. Lush green fields and beyond, swaths of long grass gently rising up one side of the valley. If he cared to look down at a more acute angle, he could see the barbed wire entanglements of the detention center's outer periphery. Then even closer at hand, the parade ground where prisoners carrying full packs were marched and drilled, usually at the double. But he preferred to look straight ahead, that the pleasant French countryside that reminded him so much of his boyhood in. Was it Wiltshire, Oxfordshire, or Berkshire? He couldn't quite remember. Later on, Gordon replaced the telephone thoughtfully. It was unnerving to have an unexpected inspection, if an inspection was the purpose of the visit. Everything, so far as he knew, was in perfect order in the prison. There had been that little problem with the French deserter who insisted that he'd been fighting for Napoleon Bonaparte. The man was obviously mad, and had been taken away to a hospital. Apart from that, everything was running smoothly. Even so, it was irritating to have civilian officials suddenly arriving like this. In the book... Zoe closes out chapter 2 by asking Colonel Gorton for tea. He says he can't refuse a lady, and then braining him with a teapot. That's an extra beat added on from TV where she merely brained him with a flower vase without decoying him verbally first. Exit Colonel Gorton. You'll note that most peripheral characters don't last more than a scene or two in the book. Shot. Both of them. I see. Right, keep me informed. That's one of them. Shot while trying to escape. Shot? Well, which one was it? The Highlander? No, but does it matter? Matter? Well, well of course it matters. Shooting down prisoners, why, it's barbaric. Well, they were trying to escape. Well, that's no excuse for murder. I, I want the other man brought here. What for? I'm not satisfied. I'd like to hear the prisoner's side of the story. <sighs> Doctor. We'll see you get a doctor if you need one, my man. Right, let him go. Uh, Commandant, dismiss your man. Oh, carry on. Hey, what are you Speak when you're spoken to! Now then, what's all this about trying to escape? Well, you know I'm not you concerned mean... with that. What about the, the other man you escaped with? Oh, he was shot in the leg, uh, and they were going to shoot me too. I see. This is very serious. I shall have to make a full report. Yeah, but they were trying to escape. My men had no alternative but to shoot. We'll see what General Smythe has to say about that. <laughs> Indeed, we will. What are you doing? I'm going to telephone General Smythe. I've had about all I can take from you, sir. Uh, you will regret General Smythe. this. Uh, the minister... I don't care two hoots about the minister. <laughs> Besides, I'm not even sure you're from the war office. Yes, where are your identity papers? My identity papers? I They're... thought so. I thought there was a fishy story all along. 
Hello, is that... In Chapter 3, a couple of minor changes. On TV, Ransom found the Doctor and Zoe at the military prison because he was there to notify the Commandant of the escape. In the book, Ransom played Sherlock Holmes and intentionally visited, quote, the most unlikely place they would be. On TV, Zoe already knows of the anachronistic TV monitor in Smythe's bedroom. But in the book, the Doctor goes into the room to play Sherlock Holmes himself. How did Smythe come out of that room ten seconds after Ransom had declared it empty? Pages 34 and 35 dip into Smythe's POV. We learn what a SIDRAT stands for. Space and Intertime Directional Robot All-Purpose Transporter. <laughs> Try saying that five times fast. This is also the first time we hear the expressions Warlords and 1917 Zone. Pages 36 and 37 introduce us to two other peripheral single-scene characters, but they're intensely fascinating. Willie Mueller and George Brown, a German soldier and an English soldier, both deserting the War of Madness and living together in the forest. Page 36. From their hidden dugout halfway up a peaceful hill, Willie Mueller from Berlin and George Brown from London stare down at the ambulance and the shell explosions either side of the road. They had been in hiding three months, both having deserted their armies. They met by chance while wandering aimlessly in the woods, each expecting the other to kill him. But instead, the enemies had become friends, and they intended to hide in their little dugout until the war was over. On TV, we see the ambulance disappear into the fog between time zones with our main characters inside. In the book, the ambulance disappears from Willie and George's point of view. Bless them, I hope they stayed together, after the Time Lords returned them to Earth. And on page 39, a deliriously funny bit, where an Imperial Roman commander, terrified at the disappearing square elephant, the ambulance, driving back into the 1917 zone, vows to, quote, sacrifice three goats, two pigs, and a human slave to make the god of war happy. A friend of the podcast, Keith Say, wants me to point out that Romans didn't practice human sacrifices to the gods, so this is a Hulk factual error. But it's a really funny paragraph, so I don't mind. Episode 3. Hulk seems to revel in describing the World War I scenario more than almost any other part of the story. Page 41 features what's likely the only reference in the whole of the target line to a sop with camel, which of course brings to mind Snoopy vs. the Red Baron. I read that portion of the book, fittingly, on Halloween night, the same night we watched It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown at Home, which features a lengthy Sop with Camel dogfight sequence, with Snoopy's doghouse standing in for the Sop with Camel. More importantly, the long sequence in General Smythe's room in the Chateau, back in the 1917 time zone, pages 42 through 44, is some of the best work Hulk has done in several books. I won't read out the whole scene, but it's got two remarkable passages. One where the doctor asks Jamie why they can't just leave. Then the doctor says something terrible is going on, and he must interfere, even though he's not supposed to. And Jamie starts pressing him as to why he's not supposed to, and who he really is. We've traveled together a long time, Jamie, says the doctor. So perhaps I should let you know who I really am. You see... And then they're interrupted by car stairs. A page later, the doctor wants to use his sonic screwdriver and asks Carstairs to look away. Why? Because I've asked you. I can't think of any other good reason. These are powerful character moments that tell us so much about the doctor. And neither of these moments are on TV. The rest of the scenes are, but not these moments. One big improvement the book has over the TV, even though it's much shorter. The character of Crane who appeared only in episode 3 and served to add some comic relief and attention to the Chateau scene, is completely excised from the book. In his place is another invented scene, where Zoe preaches feminism to Lady Jennifer, who in return accuses her of being a socialist. Zoe doesn't know what socialism is. Lady Jennifer defines it as, quote, a lot of nonsense. Brother Malcolm gets his political zingers in with rapier-like precision, but only in the book. Hulk also describes the time zone map as showing the Korean War and the American Revolutionary War. OMG, can you imagine the fanfic? Hamilton? Alexander Hamilton in a Doctor Who story? 
and a Doctor Who mash crossover? Did Big Finish ever do a Short Trips War Games anthology, filling in these time zones? Still on Chapter 4, the Doctor's confrontation with the German Lieutenant. And yes, I'm sticking to the American pronunciations for this podcast, thank you very much. The Doctor's confrontation with the German Lieutenant is kept mostly intact. Except that on TV, when the German officer threatens the Doctor with a gun, Troughton merely capitulates. In the book, the Doctor says, Would you really shoot me? In cold blood? Could you kill a man you had been talking to? This is far superior to the TV dialogue. And as I'd come to the story through the book first, I was disappointed to learn in the mid to late 1980s that that those lines were not on TV. The episode 3 material spills over into chapter 5. There's more detail to the Doctor's escape from German command, Jamie getting an action hero line when he steals the German lieutenant's gun. General Smythe gets in a conversation with a book-only character, Count Vladimir Chanikov, who's fighting the Crimean War. Greetings, from 2022, where that war is pretty much still in progress. Still in Chapter 5, Hulk introduces another single-scene-only book character, Private Cornelius Lanier of the 2nd Virginia Battalion, the sniper behind a tree out to fire on Northerners. Hulk, throughout the book, evinces tremendous sympathy for the common soldiers caught up in this war, but Cornelius, I get the sense, doesn't get that generosity extended to him. Carstairs' capture is also restaged, and there's an interesting book-only moment about Lady Jennifer's stiff upper lip about the loss of Carstairs. Page 56. Without waiting for their reply, she turned and walked ahead. Has she no human feelings? said Jamie obviously astounded by Lady Jennifer's behavior. She's an English aristocrat, the doctor explained quietly. When it comes to being brave, you can't beat them. I suggest we follow. Page 57 for me is infamous. It's this three-paragraph exchange as the doctor tries to explain the American Civil War to Zoe. This wasn't necessary on TV, where Zoe already knew what the war was. Check this. Page 57. What's this war about? Zoe asked. It started in 1861 and went on for three terrible years, said the doctor. Edit. Make that four years. Back to the book. The southern states had black slaves. I'm not using the word that Hulk put in print for reasons that Ross and I discussed earlier. Back to the book. In the northern states, owning slaves was outlawed. The north wanted the south to free its slaves so the southern states tried to leave the Union. He looked at Zoe. She had fallen asleep. Coming from the distant future, she hadn't even heard of the United States. In New York, which is where I'm sitting tonight, this is what we'd say to Malcolm Hulk about that prediction. Bleep you, buddy. Of course, this is slightly redeemed on page 58, when fresh Union soldiers arrive by time machine singing John Brown's body one of the great angry American folk songs, so raw and outrageous that the melody got intentionally repurposed into the more sentimental, sanitized, and sappy Battle Hymn of the Republic. I'm going to play you about a minute of the Pete Seeger version of John Brown's Body. I feel that Pete wouldn't mind if I played his version of the song even without proper copyright clearance. I was raised on Pete Seeger music. I even saw him perform in concert when I was about four years old. I barely remember what he played, but I know that I was there. Without further ado, here's some Pete Seeger. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. But his soul goes marching on. The stars above in heaven are looking kindly down. The stars above in heaven are looking kindly down. The stars above in heaven are looking kindly down On the grave of old John Brown Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, 
hallelujah, his soul goes marching on. One of the few great scenes on TV to not be in the book is the battle planning session between Smythe and Von Wyck late in episode 3. That's a witty moment between two antagonists. I could have sworn it was in the book, that's how good it is, but sadly, it's not. The episode 4 material is where Hulk really starts crunching the text. This takes up just 14 pages of the book, top of page 59, through the tippy top of page 72. The capture escape capture loop with Jamie and Lady Jennifer on location is completely gone. Hulk and Terrence excelled in lengthening out the war games from its originally intended six episode running time to ten episodes, but that sort of loop has no place in the book. None. On TV, as Jamie and Lady Jennifer are trapped in an American barn, they're captured first by a Yankee officer named Thompson, and then by a seditionist southerner named Leroy. In the book, Hulk merges these two into a single character, Corporal Leroy Thompson of the 3rd Virginia Battalion. Von Weich shows up right on cue, in the book as on TV, as soon as Leroy shows any sign of friendliness to Jamie and Lady Jennifer. One casualty of the book is the black Union soldier, Harper, who's not named, and who has much less dialogue than that afforded to actor Rudolph Walker, who's still alive today, 83 years young, a commander of the British Empire, and who's been on EastEnder for more than 20 years now. It's a shame that he hasn't made it over to New Who. In the book, Hulk refers to that character only by a badly dated expression, referring to his skin tone. Again, see the conversation that Ross and I had earlier. So Harper's in the book, but in a reduced capacity, and not quite as interesting as on television. Who are you? Why did you help we came from one of those other wars. You know what's going on then? You see those guys over there? They think they're fighting the war between the states. This isn't even America. Why do you think it is that? You, you came through one of those mists to get here, right? Right. But every time you go through one of those mists, you're in some other war, some other place. How long have you realized this? I started noticing things quite a while back. Then I found some other guys are the same. Y you mean there's more like you? All oh, the little gangs of us hiding in the woods, we are trying to fight. In the Warlord's headquarters, Hulk has fun expanding out the time zones, and we meet officers from many more wars than were featured on TV. Even female soldiers from the Spanish Civil War, the doctor points out, as well as Aztec warriors, hey, perhaps Ixta was there, and samurai soldiers. Hulk deletes the Vernon Dobchev character's first scene, a two-hander with the war chief, so we meet him in the book when the doctor does, in the lecture hall. The episode 4 cliffhanger, with a reprocessed car stairs pulling a gun on Zoe, is removed. The doctor sees Zoe captured on page 69, but the episode 4 material continues past that on through page 72, and we never do see car stairs with a gun. And yes, when I was a kid, I did mark up my book with choose-your-own-adventure style instructions on pages 68, 69, and 72, so I could read those scenes in TV order, rather than book order. Go me, I guess. Episode 5 takes up a little less than 8 pages in the book. That's 3 scenes. Although one of those book scenes from episode 4, Von Weich activating the security monitor in the Civil War barn, properly belongs in with this material. The security chief, played with memorably delicious weaselly villainy by the great James Bree, debuted on TV in episode 5, but all those scenes his interrogation of Zoe, and the first three or four of his 947 arguments with the war chief are all removed from the book. The doctor's capture of the scientist is much sharper in the book. He poses as a spy in the Franco-Prussian War, inspired by his own long black frock coat. Hulk narrates his thought processes, having him ask casually if the warlords have killed or captured Zoe, then threatening to wipe the scientist's mind. When he frees Carstairs, he says Carstairs is now free in mind and body. The clever line not delivered on TV, where Carstairs is both the process from the warlord's hypnosis and freed from his security restraints. Back in the American barn, Lady Jennifer, in her final scene, turns full-on feminist, perhaps inspired by Zoe earlier, telling Von Weich that she believes in the right to vote. And this amazing exchange 
on page 76. Why are you doing this? Lady Jennifer asked. Who are you, and where do you come from? That would take a lot of explaining, Von Weick replied. Most of it would be impossible for you to understand. She bridled. Because I'm a woman? No, he said. Because you are a human. I love this bit. And it's not on TV. Now, there's a variation of the line on TV, delivered by Jamie, but missing the no, because you are a human. The episode 5 material ends with the chapter 6 cliffhanger, faithful to the TV, with one exception. That exception is as follows. On TV, Von Weick isn't there. He's left behind in the American barn, where he gets a few scenes in TV's episode 6, trying to brainwash Private Moore, played by a young David Troughton. That is not in the book's episode 6 material at all. No more. Von Weick disappears after the chapter 6 cliffhanger, the book never telling us if he survives or not, whereas on TV he's pretty pretty definitively killed late in episode 6. Though, of course, the incredible Shrinking Sidrat episode 6 cliffhanger isn't in the book at all either. The deleted episode 6 material adds flavor and dimension, if not actual depth, on TV, but such material would be monotonous in the book. The idea that Moore is played by Patrick Troughton's son would have no meaning in the book, well, I guess maybe in the David Troughton narrated audiobook, but not on the printed page, then the episode cliffhanger, episode 6 cliffhanger, I should say, is one of the more obvious tells that Hulk and Terrence had to create for episodes worth of material out of whole cloth to turn this thing into a ten-parter. Of course, even though it barely consumes ten pages in the book, the episode 6 material that Hulk does adapt is crisp and memorable. Chapter 7, titled The Security Chief, adds extra meaning to James Bree's character's first appearance. And this is important to note. The earlier and more highly acclaimed throughout fandom Hulk books had very detailed character sketches. Dr. Quinn and Miss Dawson in The Cave Monsters, Captain Dent and Wilf Norton in The Doomsday Weapon, even Governor Trenchard in The Sea Devils. This book does not feature chapter-long character bios of, say, the war chief or the scientist. That's probably one reason why this book isn't as popular among fandom at large as it is with me. But working at a very compressed rate, Hulk still finds great observations. Pages 80 and 81, the security chief, quote, He was a small man who enjoyed immense power. He did not like people to see how short he was, so often he remained standing. Different from the war chief, the security chief wore a simple black uniform without braid or piping. It made him look very sinister. Later, quote, the security chief squeezed the scientist's shoulder and gave a smile that sound shivers down the scientist's spine. Brr. Although the book version of the scene does rob Vernon Dobchev of the distinction of being the first actor in Doctor Who to utter the phrase, Time Lords. What Hulk adds, even to the minuscule Episode 6 adaptation, is again superior to what's televised. The Doctor's business of using his sonic screwdriver to make a hole in the wall in the Warlord's base is undercut in the book, as Karstiz realizes that the panels just slide from side to side, and no gimmicky gadgets are needed. Also in the book, the scene where the War Chief realizes that the scientist is doing the Security Chief's dirty work is improved by Hulk having the War Chief flatter the scientist as a genius who has the eye of the Warlord, a more subtle way of restoring the scientist's loyalties to himself, the War Chief. Hulk also describes the items in the Warlord's wardrobe, having the Doctor deliver a fun historical fact about the reason why Catherine the the Great ordered buttons sewn onto the sleeves of the Russian soldiers' greatcoats, and just why suits of armor are impractical on the battlefield. The episode 6 cliffhanger would probably fall on page 88, if the book had it at all. Hulk greatly simplifies this long sequence by having the Doctor and Jamie and Zoe and Carstairs and all the Rebels leave together, rather than in two groups, with the Doctor and Jamie and Carstairs having to make a detour to retrieve the scientist's brainwashing machine, which is how the War Chief catches him at that cliffhanger. Again, this is fun material on TV, but not strictly necessary for the book, which is already at the outermost limit of the target page count of the era, like I said earlier. And besides, the inventions that Hulk adds here 
make these nine pages or so a fun read, even while missing so much of the TV material. Episode 7 is restored to a relatively robust 15 pages, almost as long as the episodes 5 and 6 material combined. On TV, this was the episode that brought General Smythe back as a surprise returning villain. Yes, that's right, the story ran for so long that bringing back the principal antagonist from episodes 1 and 2 in the same story counted as a returning villain. I kind of love that, you know? The first dozen or so scenes from episode 7, yes, including the recycled footage of the charging Roman legions from the episode 2 cliffhanger, are cut out of the book entirely. This removes the warlord's first appearance. Philip Madoc's delivery of his character's second line, but they have been overcome, is one of the most gorgeous line readings in the 59-year history of the entire series. It kicks the character's debut back into the middle of Chapter 8. Because the TV series splits up the Doctor and Jamie and Zoe in between Episodes 6 and 7, whereas, of course, they stay together in the corresponding book material, the book has to contrive a different way for everyone to wind up back at the Chateau. This is a terrific battle sequence, original to the book in Chapter 7. The group realizes they've been spotted by British soldiers. The Doctor acts as a decoy, and approaches the soldiers, while the rest of the group, led by Sergeant Russell, doubles behind a ridge to ambush the soldiers from behind, except that another group of British soldiers then nips in and captures the Doctor. Great stuff, a double ambush, which Carstairs ruefully admires from captivity in the next chapter. Of course, even if this is invented material for the book, it's still a capture-escape-capture loop, and it's resolved within four pages. Russell storms the chateau, kills Smythe, who just sentenced the Doctor to death for a second time, and all our friends are reunited once more. Whereas on TV, the party with the Doctor, Jamie, and Carstairs are caught in a similar pincer once they arrive in 1917, the long way around, detouring into Rome first, again while Zoe watches helplessly, and again Russell comes to the rescue with the Chateau. But the book does this in a few taut and economical pages, what takes almost 15 minutes to achieve on TV. The Warlord's first scene in the book, again deferred from his first scene on TV, is terrific. They have made a very stupid mistake, he says. Quote, the Warlord waited to see which of his subordinates would ask what the mistake was. Neither was foolish enough to betray his own lack of imagination. And two pages after that, page 97, is Malcolm having tremendous fun giving a spoken line or two each to a glorious array of accents. An Australian soldier who says, good on ya, sport. A New Yorker, fighting for the Union, who pronounces lieutenant the way that I've been doing all this podcast, even though in proper English it's lieutenant. Hey, we New Yorkers gotta stick together. Then who could forget Boris Ivanovich Petrovich of the House of Trebetskoy, who swings his sword in circles high in the air and promises to bring death to the enemy. None of that's on TV in episode 7, even while by this point the book has now caught up to the TV and the back half of chapter 8 is basically a straight adaptation with only a few embellishments, i.e. slightly better dialogue and observational humor of the kind you've come to expect from Hulk, in which I don't need to read out word for word. Episode 8 is where the main TV story picks back up steam after four episodes with lots of detours. The book devotes one chapter each to the last T three TV episodes. This material is again brief by page count, but lean and ferocious by content. Page 104 is special. Savor it. Although in publication order, we already know all about the Doctor being a Time Lord fugitive. Remember, the target novelizations proper began with the very first story of the Pertwee era, and the prologue to that first book, Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion, episode 4 of this podcast, begins with a recap of the end of episode 10 of The War Games. And even if you read the Target books in story order, as my friend Tony Witt does over on the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the Doctor's Time Lord origins has been anachronistically spilled in several earlier books, including but not limited to The Massacre. But it's still special to read the War Chief telling the Doctor that he knows who he is, and for the Doctor to get defensive when the War Chief says they're both alike. Or Turo VR, or, if you will, Alfonso Bedoya, or as Ross would say, Eli Wallach, arrives on page 107 as the Mexican Bandit King. This bit is just a tad culturally suspect. In Mexico, 
and I'm not even going to attempt the accent. In Mexico, all is war, VR says in the book. The soldiers kill the peasants, we kill the soldiers. It's still a memorable two-episode role from TV, and VR is equally fun in the book. Well, where is this rascal? He's not here. Well, then I go. But wait! I think perhaps you'd better meet our other leader. Uh, who is this? Call everyone together for a meeting, huh? Why? Maybe you plan to take over my territory, huh? Oh, oh no, 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 it's nothing like that, no. Unity is strength. Uh, unity is strength. And when you have these strength, what do you do with it? I uh, do with it, I, uh, uh, We attack the aliens, support everybody. Uh, we attack them all together in force. You bring all the resistance together in one place, you know what happens? So we rob and kill each other. You'll never win unless you all work together. It's the only way. Why you let a woman speak for you? I will say that in one of the rare instances where the TV dialogue is better, Doctor Who has rarely been funnier than that scene above, where Jamie pretends to be a tough warrior chieftain in order to impress VR, but winds up merely serving as Zoe's hype man as Wendy Padbury takes over the conversation. That's not really in the book at all, apart from VR's shock that the men let a woman speak for them. In its place on page 109 is the story of Petrov Ilyevich, a Russian soldier from the Crimean War who becomes an unexpected hero. Quote, Slowly he extricated himself, glad to find that none of his limbs was broken, and even more important, he had not lost the Tsar's rifle. There is a character named Petrov on TV who has three lines in episode 8, but he's not the Petrov of the book but rather Boris Ivanovich Petrovich from the Chapter 8 material above. While Chapter 9 is missing most of the TV material set in the Chateau, the long, looping dialogue scenes, it adds a wicked aside from the Warlord, who on TV the Doctor is assigned to help. In the book, that goes on for two extra beats. I am not one to force a man to do something against his nature, he tells the Doctor on page 112. If you prefer to remain our enemy, I shall simply kill you. Boris Ivanovich Petrovich exits the story on page 114, the only one to realize that the doctor has set an ambush for the resistance leaders, but he believes the doctor to be a magician and trusts him because, quote, of course, a magician must know everything. The episode 8 material and chapter 9 end together on page 115 with one of the more memorable target line typos, the found poetry of which is how I still think of the line. As the war chief tells the doctor, you have brought us a neat little package to dispose of that's brought with a G instead of a B. Episode 9, another great TV exchange with the second Doctor knowingly and mischievously baiting the war chief, a scene that is sadly missing, or an exchange of dialogue that is sadly missing from the novelization. How did you solve it? It's not a thing one can explain in a few words. We'll discuss it later. Now we really should join the Warlord. You haven't solved it, have you? Your machines have a limited lifespan. Sooner or later, they're going to be useless. Very well. Yes, you're right. Now I understand. It's my TARDIS that you're after, isn't it? Exactly. When we are in control, the machines I have brought with me will have expired. While the doctor's bit with the war chief is better on TV than in the book, the book at least makes up for it with Arturo VR giving a much more vivid accounting on page 116 of how he plans to take his revenge on the Doctor. Some guest character only scenes were cut from the book, no big loss. The Doctor in print gives a much more elaborate demonstration of the fake brainwashed Jamie to impress the war chief with talk of hereditary chieftains and true Highlanders being kidnapped by the English but the scene where the security chief reveals to the war chief that he knows of the latter's betrayal is sadly missing the following dazzling TV exchange. What a stupid fool you are. 
You deliberately disobeyed the warlord's orders. Arrest him. Arrest him! You are no longer in command. I will take over as supreme galactic ruler. You can help me rule. If you will cooperate. I had all discussion that took place between you and the doctor recorded. What a stupid fool you are. Chapter 10 in the book is otherwise faithful to episode 9 on TV. The doctor's reveal of his Time Lord heritage and call for help, with a, quote, babbling of whispering voices coming from the little squares of metal. A sound and image that would return in Neil Gaiman's first new series episode is just as powerful in print, although the security chief's quick death at the hands of the war chief is slightly more meaningful on TV via Edward Brayshaw's line about having a personal debt he had to settle. The Time Lord's arrival is heralded by several gusts of cold wind, an image that Hulk uses successfully several times within a few pages. And the exit of Lieutenant Carstairs is so much better in the book than on TV. Page 130. Did my side win? asked Carstairs, gripping the doctor's hand. Was all the death and misery for nothing? You have answered your own question, Lieutenant. War is always death and misery, and both sides lose. I hope that one day you humans will find another way to settle your arguments. Episode 10. You heard me say with Ross earlier that I think episodes 1, 9, and 10 of this serial are perfect, right up there with the best half hours of the entire 1960s. Unearthly Child, Part 1, Massacre, Part 4, Web of Fear, Part 4, etc. Takes up just 12 pages in the book. There is, to be fair, a little bit of capture-escape-capture padding on TV that doesn't show up in Chapter 11, but let's focus on what is there. And the first thing to focus on is that the Doctor's explanation to Jamie and Zoe about how he ran from his own people. It's much better on TV. There's more dialogue, and Troughton makes the perfect actor's choices in playing this dialogue rushed and defensive and defiant. Wendy Padbury's What Do You Mean You Were Bored is also one of the best line readings in 1960's Doctor Who. Let's play one last audio clip from the TV episode. Oh, what was happening? Why was it so difficult to move? (coughs) It was the Time Lords. They're your own people, aren't they, Doctor? Yes, that's right. Why why could you run away from them in the first place? Uh, I was bored. What do you mean you were bored? Well, the the Time Lords are an immensely civilized race. Uh, We can control our own environment. We we can live forever, barring accidents, and we have the secret of space-time travel. Well, what's wrong in all that? Well, we hardly ever use our great powers. We we can simply to to observe and gather knowledge. And that wasn't enough for you? No, of course not. Without the whole galaxy to explore, millions of planets, eons of time, countless civilizations to meet. Well, why do they object to you doing all that? Well, it it is a fact, Jamie, that I, I do tend to get involved with things. Oh, you can say that again. Whenever there's any trouble, he's in it right up to his neck. But you've helped people, Doctor. Yes, yes, but that's no excuse in their eyes. Well, then what are you going to do? Oh, you're going to run away. I've set the controls to take us to a planet on the outermost fringes of the galaxy. Oh, in that case, we'll probably end up right in their lap. (laughs) Bernard Horsfall's voiceover line, You have returned to us, Doctor. Your travels are over. A wonderfully fatalistic line on TV is also cut out of the book. But the Time Lords, an awesome presence with magical powers, in this serial only but never ever again, still shine on the printed page. The trial room, on the planet not yet called Gallifrey, is quote, a large space, not a room for they could see no walls, yet not outside for they could see no sky. And when the warlord is killed, dematerialized as if he never existed, Philip Maddock cries, no, no, no a direct foretelling of what Patrick Troughton's last words will be several minutes later. This goes on for longer on TV, capture, escape, capture, but it's much more direct in the book, and the warlord gives one last vicious speech in his own defense, his voice carrying on for moments after his body disappears forever. The doctor's defense, in his own trial, that the Time Lords are so downright dull, is a wonderful book line that you can hear, Patrick Troughton's voice, even if he didn't get to say it on TV. 
The bit with Zoe using her wits to break through the Time Lord force field, scripted for TV but not filmed that way, is better than the TV sequence, where a Time Lord merely forgets to turn the force field back on. The departure of Jamie and Zoe, and the conclusion of the Doctor's trial, is just four pages in the book. The material breathes a little better, and is much more emotional on TV. But I came to those scenes through the book first, and I can attest that they work equally well, even if you haven't seen the TV. Both episode 10 and this chapter 11 are incredible, some of Doctor Who's finest fiction. And the final passage from the book goes on a bit further than on TV, and gives the Time Lords the last word. And now it is time for Fraser to give us one last guest reading from Doctor Who and the War Games. While the trial continued, two Time Lord technicians were checking over the Doctor's TARDIS. They were intrigued by its shape and puzzled by the words police and telephone on its little windows. Their inspection was interrupted by the familiar materialisation sound. It was a common enough sound to them, but they were not expecting an arriving TARDIS. The box-like object took shape in line with the others. Strangely, its door remained closed. Curious, the two technicians went forward to investigate. Possibly the door had jammed and a Time Lord inside was trapped. As they approached, the door flew open. Five silver-uniformed security guards from the planet of the Warlords came out, firing their stun guns and killing the two Time Lords instantly. They raced for the area where the Warlord was on trial. The voice from above was pronouncing judgement. We find you guilty. That one of your party, your war chief, was once a Time Lord gives you no excuse. Had he lived, he would have been punished your attempt to incriminate the Time Lord who wishes to be called the Doctor is equally useless. Your crimes were monstrous and your punishment will be severe. The five security guards came running into the court, aiming their weapons at the Time Lords and the three witnesses. Smiling, the Warlord stepped down from his dais. Thank you, gentlemen. This farce is now over. We shall return to our planet. The Warlord looked up towards the unseen voice. And we shall bring vengeance upon the planet of the Time Lords. A finger of brilliant white light stabbed down, engulfing and paralysing the Warlord where he stood. The five gods all looked up instinctively. As they did, fingers of light also fell onto them. All were frozen instantly. This isn't fair, the Warlord shouted. After sentence, there should be a right of a Heal. I too could produce witnesses, and you have no authority over me. You have only heard half my story. The great voice spoke. You and your murderous accomplices will be dematerialised. It will be as though you never existed. The six stabbing fingers of light increased in intensity. The warlord and his security guards slowly began to fade. No! screamed the warlord. You don't understand. We wish to bring everlasting peace, a new order for the whole universe. Peaceful coexistence, a place for you, a place for us. Only the beams of light now remained. Yet the warlord's voice, though fading, could still be heard. We shall win. We shall be masters of the universe. We have the superior intelligence. It is our destiny to rule. The light snapped out. Not a trace remained of the warlord and the five gods who had come to rescue him. Bravo! exclaimed the doctor. Good riddance! He looked up. I'm glad that my evidence was so useful to the court. He turned to Joey, Zoe and Jamie. Well, come along. We'd better continue with our travels. No! boomed the voice. You will now stand your trial. Let us hear the accusations. The accusing Time Lord spoke. The charges are two. Appropriation of a TARDIS without permission and interference into other people's affairs. The latter is the most grave since non-interference is our most important law. Well, asked the voice, do you admit these actions? It isn't a very good TARDIS, said the Doctor. It doesn't change shape and it won't go where I want it to go. That is the lesser charge said the other Time Lord present. What of non-interference? 
I wanted to help people to combat evil. Look how I've risked my life fighting the Daleks. They want to exterminate everyone. Then there are the Cybermen, a nasty lot. Do you know about the Crotons and the Yeti? Not forgetting the Quarks. And the Ice Warriors. It's true I've interfered, but always on the side of good against evil. Then you admit the charge? Thundered the accusing Time Lord. Yes, of course I do. But your way of observing and doing nothing, it makes life so... so... Yes, boomed the voice. The doctor looked upwards. It's so downright dull. We've heard your defence, said the voice. You'll be held in custody while we consider our judgment. A Time Lord came forward to lead the doctor away. What about my two friends? he asked the court. Whatever the outcome for you, said the voice, they will be well treated. You know that we are always just. Yes, said the doctor, hanging his head. I know only too well. There we go. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Thank you for the 50 episodes so far. And I'm really looking forward to the next 50. Keep up the good work. Next time on Doctor Who Literature, it's November 1979, and Terence Dix's last book of the 1970s. Again, one of his shortest efforts, but a book that is very personal for me. We're not going to play rock, paper, scissors. We're not going to talk about how elephants aren't pink, but we are, along with a first time guest going to discuss Doctor Who and the destiny of the Daleks. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. Special thanks to my special guest, Ross Aiken, and thanks as well to all of my contributors for the audio clips that were played in this episode. Mark, Fraser, Andrew, Kevin, UK Jason, Conrad, All of you guys are the best. This podcast can be found on most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at anchor.fm slash Doctor Who Lit. It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels. That's DR Who Novels. My old tweets about the entire series under the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage. That's DR Who Pilgrimage. My current Twilight Zone watch through under TZ Pilgrimage. And on email at Doctor Who Literature, that's drwholiterature at gmail.com. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Thank you for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Doctor Who Podcast Network.